Welcome to the Pinning Combination Podcast. I'm KJ Belcher alongside Dick Rick. Well, not alongside, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, Bridgie, uh, how's it going here? We're a week, more than a week into January. Only uh, six weeks away from the state tournament. That sounds weird for preps and, uh, you know, uh, less than two months away from conference and uh, tournaments for Division One, and and just about two months away from national tournaments. Actually, seems like it's gone by really fast. Yeah. So the uh, with the with the state tournament, you, you back that up three weeks. You know, to include or two weeks anyway to include districts and sectionals. So your tournament time is going to be going and about a month i you know i guess right so um yeah that's it's it's getting to be crunch time for the for the preps or close to crunch time for the preps and uh so so this this time of year you know you've got some guys that have cut down on the prep side and on the college side actually that their descent plan probably allowed them to finally get down to their maybe their desirable weight um, and some are they're playing around like you mentioned Wyatt volker uh earlier uh, uh this week and uh you know who knows where he's going to land? I don't know if it matters that much, really. But but that those types of sort of things are going on. Yeah. So uh, let's start with uh, the, the college action uh, uh, this week. It was a big weekend for uh, debuts in the college level. Um, you're looking at uh, Nick Suriano stepped in at Michigan. Uh, Drew Hildebrandt at uh, uh, Penn State. Uh, of course, Iowa had Drake Ayala um, make all his that. official debut and Michael Kemmerer. Right. Uh, all, those first three all at 125. So 125 weakened when Lee got out, and then all of a sudden, kabam. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <That's the> doctor, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no surprise that Ayala, um, you know, made his debut. Uh, I, w- I was maybe a little surprised that they had him wrestle against McKee uh, on Friday. Uh, wasn't surprised about Sunday. Um, but, uh, you know, it was the third time him and McKee wrestled in, in the last month. McKee uh, was another victory, 8-6 to six this time. But uh, overall, I think it was a great, uh, great weekend. Uh, and I, I, I can walk away this, from this weekend. I think feeling good, even though he lost to McKean, and that's not, you know that's not what they wanted. But he was one move away from winning that. I mean, he really, in my opinion, out wrestled him except for the takedown when he held on a little too long and went to his back for two. Uh, you know, that's probably a freshman mistake. And uh, you know, he has such a great left-handed snap down. And 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 uh, that being said, I mean, he he scored that first one with that, and then couldn't score epic, you know, because McKee, McKee adjusted. And then, uh, but he's going to have to have something that's, that complements that. So, because he kept going back to that, well, it wasn't there. And uh, but he was defending it. So now we've got to get that complimentary move that gets him thinking over here while he attacks down here, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, yep. uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Tom Brand said, and this, you know, just comes, maybe it was just the, the situation being in Tarver, you know, for the first time. Maybe it's just simply a freshman mistake. He mentioned, you know, he had the pressure on the key, gets a stalling call. They come back to the center, and he said, you know, Drake comes back, hands on his knees, and right off the whistle, the key, who's a little more experienced, recognized that, hit him with the blast double that led to that uh, – that extra two near fall too that you were mentioning holding on. And uh, that's the difference in the match right there. Right. Um, yep. When you, you, when you, you know, stuff you can correct. I mean, that's exactly. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, he, he should know that, but it's, it, it just I means he's been such a quality high school wrestler, prep wrestler that, you know, and you get to that college level and now you're stepping up and every match is going to be like that. But you know, when you, when the guy's down, by a point or two, and you're coming back to the middle, and you put that foot on that line, you got to be ready to either attack or defend. But you got to be ready to wrestle for sure. And, and uh, not to, s- to say that he wasn't, but that's that was the turning point in the match. So, 
Yeah, that definitely was. Um, and then Sunday against uh, uh, Devin Schroeder, who uh, Lee beat in the conference finals last year, uh, I thought uh, you saw even even a big improvement from Friday night with the way that he wrestled. Of course, I think the matchup was a little more favorable. I don't think Schroeder's is physical and stuff on their feet and as long as you can stay out from underneath and uh Ayala was able to do that and you know show right. show games just within a couple days. Right. And you know and that's what rankings are kind of do for a person on the on the plus side. Here here we you know uh, Drake beat the number fifth ranked kid and uh you know now he's walking away feeling good about that one. And you know so you know who knows if he's the fifth ranked kid or the fifth best kid or not we'll find out in, in March but but uh, you know that's that's where those come into play, and yeah, that, he had a good good match for sure, and, and uh, you know didn't wrestle bad on Friday, not at all. Wrestled, I think, really well, and then uh, equally as as good on Sunday. Uh, Iowa uh, beat Minnesota 22-10. Wasn't necessarily a great uh, showing from top to bottom. Um, you know, a little sluggish. Uh, you know, Marinelli, a guy that you would figure maybe you'd get bonus points against, uh, you know, gets a one point win. Cameron, his debut, looked good, um, but still only a, a decision there of 174. Of course, that turned around for him on Sunday as well. But, um, you know, DeSanto, Ironman, um, with decisions, uh, they just looked like they uh, they were they didn't have quite the same energy, and that turned around for for Sunday though. Right, and and uh, you know, this is my honest gut feeling. You know, this is kind of an observation, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the the expectations for the Iowa wrestlers from the coaches, from the wrestlers, from the fans, is that you destroy your opponent. You don't win by one or two points. And there's been a, a lot of matches this in, in December and early January now that, that they have had close outcomes and it, whether they've won or even lost a couple of close ones, you know, and that now is the time to be separating and really putting the pressure on because you can build your confidence and destroy your opponent's confidence for future matches. And, you know, there's guys that are, you know, when you wrestle the, the kids you're wrestling, obviously that's going to be effect, uh, effective. But, if, you know, let's face it, wrestlers look online and see how the Iowa wrestlers did or how their opponent, future opponents are, you know, did again. You know, they kind of compare that. So um, you can you can really get to your future opponents by beating your current opponent, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Big. So, you know, that I, and I like to see, and I know a lot of the, coaches and fans and, and obviously the wrestlers too want to step it up and, and uh, try and make that separation get to those bonus point wins. You know, the, the one I thought on Friday that I thought wrestled uh, really well, I thought was Ava Saad. I thought we saw a little bit more uh, uh, aggressiveness and I don't know exactly, uh, you know, how good the skillings kid is from, Minnesota, but Ava Saad was the one that I thought was uh, maybe at the front end of Iowa's performance there with what he was able to do with a major decision at 184. I thought the same thing. I thought, I don't know how strong the opponent is, but I really loved Assad's low-level attacks. I think he had, oh, I want to say four or five takedowns in that uh, uh, in that match, and, and like you said, they were they were strong, you know, sweep singles, um, a varied, uh, a varied offense uh, from him. Yeah, you know, a lot, lot going on there, and that, that was good. So I thought it, that's a nice addition now to the to the lineup, along with uh, Kemmerer and, and uh, of course, uh, Ayala. You know, at one seventy four, uh, they uh, removed the. Uh, Red shirt on Swafford, and uh, and I think for all intents and purposes that they were expecting 
Swafford to be the guy and, and Temer ends up being ready to go and, and wrestling Friday and Saturday. I mean, I know they're going to need Swafford because of depth anyway. Um, you know, if, if Brands is going to be out for the season. Um, but, uh, you know, do you, you know, do you kind of agree with that move with, uh, you know, removing some of these shirt and, you know, I've been giving this a little bit of thought because last uh, last week on our podcast, I almost mentioned, I don't understand why Swafford took his, his red shirt off at the scuffle. Right. And so then I'm also thinking, where did that stem from? You know, Swafford has to take control of his own red shirt. And so did he say, yeah, I want, you know, we we're going to wrestle there. Was he told that he was going to be you know, wrestle sometime in the future? And if so, you know, now I can take my red shirt off. Then I can, you know, not have to pay and find my own way down to the scuffle. And, and uh, I can wear the Iowa uniform. But on the other hand, gosh, you know, to me, I think it's more, it just makes more sense to pull that red shirt off when you're actually in a dual, you know, situa situation, not in a, an open tournament. So I, that just kind of made me wonder. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. If, I'm not saying there should be blame or anything, but, but that, you know, they're, um, you got to take control of your own red shirt. And then I don't know what the communication was. So maybe there's a breakdown in communication as well from coach to athlete or from Kemmer to coach or from Kemmer to, to Swafford. And, and I think you're right. He's going to see some matches down the road. Uh, you know, that shoulder seems a little bit iffy. Um, so we'll see. Uh, the one other thing too, uh, uh, from the Minnesota duel that, that really stood out. And, um, I think a lot of people have addressed it was, uh, Gable Stevenson, uh, with a, with a big win, I think 17, seven over, uh, uh, Tony Cassiope, uh, at the end of the match, the Iowa crowd, uh, stood up and, and gave him a standing ovation. Um, you know, I'm sure you've probably seen that moment or heard about it. You know, what are your thoughts about uh, something like that with, you know, uh, an athlete like Stevenson really kind of getting the, uh, maybe the, the response that he deserves uh, as an Olympic champ and NCAA champ? Uh, first of all, with, with, um, with Stevenson, I'm going to say this right now. That guy is incredible. He's the best heavyweight I've ever seen. He's so athletic, so strong, so powerful. It's like he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there was a time there where, uh, you know, he made like a, just a far reaching leg snatch and then dropped Cassiope down on his hip and, and got a takedown. And it's like, he he made it look so easy and, and effortless. And it's like, you're doing that against an All-American heavyweight that's, uh, you know, I, I think Cassiope's down to about 240, but still he does that regardless of size. And uh, I mean, it's just not supposed to be like that. It, exactly. Yeah. It makes me wonder why Kyle Snyder and Jaden Cox, the Matrix, right, uh, aren't up there training with him. <laughs> Yeah. He's going to be around and wrestling for you know just a few more months. Yeah, he's he's just he's definitely a generational talent, and I know there are, I know there are big uh, expectations for him, um, but I think you've even seen the evolution in the last couple of years um, of, of just how he's grown and and taken that next step from you know when Anthony Kassar, uh when he faced Kassar uh, a couple of years ago in, in those matches. Right. With, with Stevenson, uh, man, he's so fun to watch. And uh, the uh, uh, standing ovation, I can, I was thinking of one other time that I saw something similar to that. And it was at the national tournament. You can tell me the year, the year that Marker Island won it. And a, mm -hmm. a wrestler from, uh, was he from, Washington or Oregon, somewhere up there. Dan, Portland, Portland State. Oh, Portland State. Thank you. And he, the, like Dan, and what was his last name? Jeez, I'm Russell or 
four-time national champ at the D2 level. And of course, that was back at the time where the D2 and D3 champions uh, qualified for the uh, a D1 national tournament as well. Uh, it was a two-time All-American at the D1 level, placing fourth. And you mentioned that uh, the last time you saw an ovation like uh, what Stevenson got, uh, came then. Right. It was, and he is such a likable guy. He, was, he I mean, the guy, he basically won over the entire Carver Hawkeye arena. I mean, every team, every school, including Iowa, when, when he was wrestling <laughs> Ryland, you know, and, and uh, you know, Ryland beat him, but, but they still just gave him such a, a, a neat ovation. And that, that's another one that reminds me of, you know, of, of Iowa, the Iowa Carver Hawkeye, uh, you know, extending their warmth to, and that, and that magnitude towards a, a, an opponent. And of course, uh, a lot of people uh, already know that he was named after Dan Gable. His name's Gable Dan, I believe. Um, you know, there is a picture in the tunnel between that had him and Dan Gable together. I mean, that was a pretty special moment, even with Randy Lewis uh, kind of lurking in the background. <laughs> As well, I, saw, I noticed that Lewis was back there as well. That looked kind of funny, but yeah. uh, that's not the first time those guys have had their picture taken together. They've they've done it, you know, as as uh, Stevenson was uh, growing growing up, coming up, you know, in the youth ranks, and and uh, so it's been kind of fun to see those pictures for sure when those two are together. Uh, and then speaking of uh, Sunday, just moving on to the Purdue uh, duel. Um, Iowa's performance looked a lot better, a lot crisper, a lot sharper. They won nine out of ten uh, uh, matches there. The only one uh, they didn't was at 133, and Austin DeSanto uh, uh, took the day off, according to Tom Brands. Um, no issues or, or anything like that, he says. Um, but, uh, you know, they just looked – more energetic, more more crisp. We already talked about Ayala. Um, you know, Marinelli looked good. Twenty-two to seven technical fall there. Um, you know, Max Murin with a, a major decision. Uh, Kemmerer with a seventeen to one tech as well at seventy-four. It just seemed like uh, everybody except for maybe Ironman looked a little crisper and stronger. I would agree with that. And the scores indicate that for sure. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, with DeSanto, I can only guess I'm, you know, it's a Friday to Sunday uh, turnaround. So maybe weight was an issue. Maybe just, I need a rest sort of thing. Who knows, but you know, that's all right. Cause you know, the rest of the team stepped up big time and, and, uh, you know, it wasn't even close. And that's a, a team that had just beaten Nebraska. Am I correct on that? Uh, on Friday, yeah, 15 on Friday. Yeah. So, um, so that's, you know, that's a nice team and, and probably the strongest showing for Iowa here in at least in a, a few meets uh, this season. So if not the strongest yet. Yeah. And, that, and that's a, you bring up a, a good point uh, with Purdue. Um, they're seven and two. Uh, their two losses coming to Iowa and of course to uh, Iowa State at Humboldt. Um, but, uh, you know, Purdue's got a strong strong dual team really when you look at it yes they performed well and not so well on sunday <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's right of course uh you know uh iowa um i think uh only gave up one takedown in the nine matches that they won that was to uh uh, Heifer, or not Heifer, sorry, uh, Ironman um, gave up uh, a takedown there, but um, the rest of the matches uh, they had they ended up with a twenty-seven to four uh, advantage when it came to uh, takedown. So it definitely got things kind of ironed out or turned around in between uh, a couple of days there. Right. And it's not like they had to do a whole lot. It, it's just, you know, I mean, that's a, an experienced, talented Iowa lineup. 
I mean, even probably the youngest guy is Assad, right? Uh, well, uh, I, yeah, Ayala. Ayala. But, but uh, um, after that, then Assad, who's spent, this is his third year on varsity, I think, at least partially. So, um, so it's an experienced team. So it's not like they had to do a whole lot. It's more of a mindset to just get out there and, and perform sort of a thing. So I think they're probably anxious after Friday to, to try and, you know, right the ship a little bit. I don't think Coach Brands was very excited about Friday's victory. No, no. Um, hey, just to backtrack really quick, I uh, decided to look up um, that uh, 1991 bracket. Uh, Dan Russell was the number one seed at the D1 tournament. Uh, his first win was over Brian Woods of Michigan State. Then he beat uh, Fortnick, Chris Fortnick of, uh, of North Carolina State. Any guesses on who his uh, quarterfinal match was against? If it wasn't Ryland. That was semi. No, that was semi. Okay. Um, I don't know. He uh, he wrestled for Oklahoma State and uh, later became uh, Hawkeye. Um. Uh, well, did Perry ever wrestle for my? Uh, let's see. Would be. Um, oh, not Crazy Ray. Yes. Crazy Ray Brinzer. Brinzer yeah. Beat him three to two. All right. In the quarters. That was uh, Brinzer's freshman year. He was the eighth seed. Ryland was the fourth seed. Uh, beat Russell five to four. Uh, so uh, it was just a one point match there. And of course, we know how the finals worked out. Uh, Russell uh, came back to wrestle for third and ended up. Uh, Losing that uh, that final match, that third place match to Charlie Jones of Purdue, who I think might have been a national champ the following year. How about that? Yeah, Brinzer. I mean, he just he was a fabulous wrestler. So losing by a point to Brinzer is no. I mean, obviously when you're number one seed, you don't want to lose at all. But but uh, you know that's nothing to get too you know to down about it. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, the, the Purdue duel, um, you know, we, we saw uh, – I, I got to talk to Tony Ursula beforehand. He kind of mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, they've been battling injuries and, and kind of illness a little bit. Same thing he said Nebraska kind of had the same thing going around. Uh, just about everybody's dealing with it. Uh, Kendall Coleman did not wrestle at 157. Um you know, but that was pretty much uh, – that was just about the only real starter that they were missing. We already mentioned DeSanto uh, didn't wrestle at 133, and Jesse Ibarra moved up um, there. Uh, you know, we saw the return of Max Lyon, too. Uh, uh, Ibisad came away with a 6-3 win, but, uh, you know, Max Lyon ranked 23rd, and in his final year seems to – uh, be trying to I think I read Tim O'Neill's uh, uh, article in the uh, Dubuque Telegraph Herald that the uh, Lions trying to make the most of this uh, last go around uh, here for the Boiler. Yeah, I mean, we know Max. He's a he's a good good guy. I guess we knew him as a kid. Now he's a good good guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> he had a tough trip uh, west. He. I don't. Th I think he lost also at uh, against um, Nebraska as well. So it was a tough road trip for him. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of lineups being hit, I think we're going to see more of that. And and uh, we saw it this week, this past week, uh, Thursday and Friday at the national duels. But you're going to see lineups that are just going to be. It's going to be. It, it, this is the year that it's gonna, it's going to be not just the top ten. It's going to go deep into the lineup and pretty much every weight maybe. Uh, and uh, to just, you know, to see where you're at, you know, uh, um, you know with, with the more so on the college side than the high school side, but with COVID still lurking around, you know, and, and college being tested three times a week or better, they're going to find someone here that's, you know, that's positive somewhere along the way, I'm sure. Um, in, in high school, it's more of an honor system. You don't have to test three times a week. They could, no way you could afford that, right? So. Um, you know, so you won't see it as much on high school, the high school level, but 
So those things are going to happen. You know, obviously the injury things happen every year, but with COVID, you're just, who knows, like, like we saw, you know, at the national duels with, with Co college, you know, I'm not sure what all that was about, but, but uh, they had a fragmented lineup. We had nine teams that weren't even there, including Loris and, and, and Wartburg. So those things are going to happen this year, KJ. Yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, Max Lyon actually uh, beat Taylor Venn seven to two on Friday. Oh, he uh, did? Nebraska, so. Um, I remember, did he lose against Iowa State? Maybe it's the, the, the Iowa trips. I think it was Iowa State. I think maybe. it was the Iowa trip, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah I think Coleman uh, uh, won that match. Right. Um, that's but, that school's got him. Yeah. yeah. But like you said, um, you know, you bring up a great point that, you know, nobody's going to be, uh, uh, I hate to say it, Nobody seem to be immune to this. Uh, that's a bad pun, um, yeah. you know. But uh, all all three schools were affected uh, in Iowa this um, this weekend. Um, you know, Iowa State uh, didn't have uh, their match with Arizona State. Um, you and I went up to South Dakota State. We can talk about that duel, but Wyoming was supposed to be there. And there wasn't really enough for a duel, so they just had some extra matches uh, for the Cowboys. But uh, but really, um, all three schools kind of experienced how that uh, right. How that, and then so. all three of the D one schools, and then uh, oh, I, obviously they just mentioned the D three schools. But it's just it's so disappointing that. You know, and, and on a personal level, it's even more disappointing. So, uh, you know, that, you know, here's a personally a son that my son that's, take, you know, taken a year of his life and kind of set it on hold. And now COVID's stepping its ugly foot back into the arena and and uh, playing havoc with the with that. So hopefully the NCAA can, you know, has the tournament because that would be the third year in a row for D3. But we'll see. Now, one thing I'll, I'll mention, uh, take it with a grain of salt, uh, in our staff meeting uh, this week, uh, some of the staff members uh, uh, had uh, uh, socialized with some uh, Department of Health employees who said uh, some places uh, in the country are already hitting their peak. Um, and I was usually about three weeks behind, so that'll be, you know, somewhere in February. I hope it really doesn't, you know, play a part some, uh, you know, like sectionals, districts, state. But by the time March comes around, uh, most most areas of the country should be past their their peak. So knock on wood, um, that occurs you know, with the, the D3 tournament here in Cedar Rapids, uh, which will host. Um, and then in, uh, in Detroit, which is going to host the, uh, the D1 tournament as well. So, you know. Right. And I, and I will pass this along. I don't think you would mind. Um, I, I texted briefly with, with uh, Eric Keller, Coach Keller at Warburg, who mentioned that he was encouraged with what he had heard from Ryan Callahan the fabulous trainer and, and interim athletic director, uh, not any longer, but was the interim athletic director at Warburg, that the talks were positive and, and they thought that this was going to wind down, like you said, at the end of January, the peak uh, uh, of this, the, this uh, round of, uh, of the COVID. But uh, anyway, so that was encouraging for me to hear, but I won't, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. I, I will, I have to say this, I, 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 had a fear that as soon as the national championship football game was over, now that NCAA might have an opportunity to cancel some, you know, now that they've made their money, <laughs> they just, you know, uh, but you know, their big one is their basketball too. They don't want to lose that. But. Yeah. So hopefully uh, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Um, and we don't have a repeat in 2020. And I don't think, we, I don't think we will. I'm being, optimistic so hopefully uh things keep going and we don't have any repeats of the 
past past two years for for those Division three uh, uh, programs. Um, really quick, let's touch on uh, South Dakota State. You and I, South Dakota State, with a twenty seven thirteen victory um, over number twenty two. You and I. Uh, Kyle Biscaglia, 133. Derek Holschlag, who I think has had a really good season here uh, in that competition at 157. Uh, Parker Keckheisen bumped up to 197 um, and got a fall. Uh, but those three, uh, the, the lone winners um, for you and I in, in that duel. Right. Initially, I heard that uh, Kakaisen had, had bumped up to 97 and went, all right, cool. Be Russell and Sloan, but Sloan was not in the lineup. So um, I was disappointed that I would have liked to have seen that match actually. So uh, anyway, yeah, uh, I think there was some disappointments. I'm sure on the, U in the UNI camp, I uh, you just, some of the matches weren't really that close, you know, like I'm, I, I guess I expect a lot with Kale Happel just watching through high school, <laughs> but you know, he, he lost a pretty, convincing uh, you know match 11 to 4 and uh you know i just thought that one might be closer so you know in those those types of disappointments for me as a as a former panther i guess so yeah uh and especially with uh the way he kind of wrestled before the the holiday break um you know he was looking pretty impressive um, right and, and i'm sure uh you know that that'll get uh turned around here before their next uh, competition. Two of the other things uh, mentioned, uh, Don Bosco's uh, former Don Bosco prep, Daniel Kimball, uh, wrestled for SDSU, uh, 149, beat Tristan Lara, 9-5. to five. And then uh, Kate DeVos, who's ranked 11th at 174, uh, the former uh, Southeast Polk uh, wrestler, uh, beat uh, Dewan Johnson, uh, by fall, so uh, those Iowans uh, up there in Jackrabbit territory wrestling for Damien Hahn and uh, I believe uh, Cody Caldwell still on staff. Uh, they're doing pretty well. So you had, you had DeVos wrestling who? Uh, Pat Schoenfelder. Schoenfelder, yeah. So he yeah he beat Schoenfelder ten to six, and I think Schoenfelder was actually wrestling very oh. well. So that's a pretty decent win for. For Schoenfelder. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I, I crossed over. Uh, um, Cook sorry. and Laura. I, I kind of I meshed the 74-84 uh, uh, results. Yeah, it was DeVos over Schoenfelder. Then the thing. Right, before, yeah. So, anyway, so Schoenfelder's been wrestling, I thought, pretty well. So, yeah, that was another disappointment, I guess, for me. Um, I, I, but, uh you know, so, but South Dakota State, man, they've really done a nice job in the last, I'd say, maybe decade, you know, going back to their former coach, especially, you know, and, and uh, you know, getting that thing rolling, Bono, and then, uh, you know, so it's, it's, they're not an easy out at all, for sure, they're a great team. No, they've really, they've really got things going uh, up there, you know, for, kind of for a mid-major school that, uh, you know, they, they've got new facilities. Uh, I think they had a multi-million dollar uh, athletic facility uh, upgrade that, that they made. Um, you know, they, they've got a, they've really invested in their staff after, uh, you know, they had Bono and then Bono left and then bringing in the quality uh, head coach like Damien Hahn. Um, you know, they've got – they do have some – good things going up there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how that uh, plays out. Right. And then uh, uh, it was nice to carry it over because uh, Han kept uh, Caldwell on staff. I know for sure. Uh, Cody Caldwell, uh, Iowa and Waverly Shellrock. Great. Uh, anyway, so he's done, he's, Cody's done a lot of nice, good, uh, a lot of good things up there as well. So uh, you were kind of key. You talked a little bit about the multi-divisional uh, duels down at uh, Louisville uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, mentioned kind of the, the depleted field 
um, I should say depleted field, but just some of the teams that weren't there, like Augsburg, Wartburg, Loris. Um, you know, you still had Wisconsin Lacrosse, Coe with kind of a makeshift lineup, it, it appeared. Uh, North Central, Wabash, Baldwin Wallace. Um, some really good teams in the field, but, you know, what, what was your takeaway from uh, that? Wisconsin Lacrosse and Dave Malachek uh, coming away with a dual championship. At the right. Uh, congratulations to, to Lacrosse and, and Dave Malachek and his, and his staff and his, and his team. They, they really wrestled tough that, uh, last weekend and they got it together. You know, they, they had a, a, a complete team or it seemed like it anyway. And, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm sure they had some matches that got away from them a little bit, but they, as a, as a whole, Russell pretty darn well and, and uh, walked away at their first title. So since they've held this, this format for 19 years, it's been won by, by uh, Augsburg or Wartburg. So neither Augsburg or Wartburg were in the tournament this year. So obviously someone else was going to win it. So that was nice that they can put their name on the, on the trophy and on the, you know, in history. So um, as far as Co is concerned, I saw that there were four kids out of the lineup for whatever reason, we were, you know, all the reasons we talked about already, you know, the, who knows, injury, COVID, weight, you know, all the things that can happen um, might, you know, might have played into that. Who knows? But at least they got to go there. There's 19 yeah. in the Division Three that did not get to compete. So Co jumped on the bus and got down there and got to compete and got in four or five matches, I guess, five meets. And, uh, um, you know, I, it's not what they would have liked. But they got they they got their competition, and I gotta have to I have to make special mention. It was a loss, but it was a, such a great great battle and good match. In the very first meet, Cole wrestled Mount St. Joseph, and Mount St. Joseph, seventy four pounder, is ranked number one and hasn't lost since like two thousand nineteen. He hasn't wrestled a whole lot, but uh -huh. anyway, um, he he's number one ranked, and uh, and Will Esmoyle, huh? How about that name? Yeah. He, Will Esmoyle wrestled him very, very gr good. Took him into sudden victory and had, you know, with about 15 seconds left, ended up giving up a takedown on the edge of the mat and kind of a silly shot. He went off the mat. Well, Esmoyle went off the mat, but Beecham, the number one ranked kid, was kind of straddling the line on his knees and it was looking the other direction. And Esmoyle kind of charged into him and gave him position and gave up the takedown. Oh, but shit. Beecham was on the ropes. He, he had him. I, I think he's going to win it. And, and Esmoyle bumped up. He weighed in at 165, bumped nice. up to 104 and almost had that number one wrestler beat. So I, I just had to mention it was such a great match and, and uh, it was fun to watch. And I wish Will would have pulled away that with that victory. But anyway, uh, Co ended up uh, losing or beating uh, Mount St. Joseph 27 16. They lost to RIT 27 15. They beat Adrian 30 to 19, and then they lost to Baldwin Wallace 20 to 17. And then for eighth place, they wrestled Milliken and lost uh, 28 to 26. Now, keep in mind, they were forfeiting 125. So they were given, they were starting six points behind every, every match with one of their best wrestlers. So that in itself, that weight in itself would have been a, a, a turnaround in each one of those meets, uh, let alone the other three that weren't there. We did see Riley Wright come back into the lineup. He has he wrestled the very first meet maybe against Central, I think, and have it hasn't wrestled since. And he was uh, wrestled in two uh, two of the meets on uh, on uh, the second day on Friday. So it's good to see Riley back. Um, anyway, uh, that's kind of this, this rundown on code. Dubuque also wrestled there. They they lost three meets. They wrestled Baldwin Wallace. Uh, Concordia Moorhead and, and Mount St. Joseph. Actually, they I take that back. They they uh, beat Mount St. Joseph. It was tied to 22 to 22, and then it went to the tiebreaker. And and uh, Dubuque had scored 38 match points, and and uh, Mount St. Joseph 37. So, <laughs> oh wow, win there. Went right down. Um, Division two, Upper Iowa, uh, then. Russell, they did not place. They beat Tiffin 30 to 13, lost to Newberry 25 to 18, and then lost to Fort Hayes 24 to 15. Uh, Jordan Baumler went 3 and 0, and then Caden Anderlich and Chase uh, Lundsman went 2 and 0. 
you know, the one of the things that kind of stands out from the, uh, I mean, really, uh, as far as Iowa goes, um, you know, Grandview. Grandview mm-hmm. coming away with their 10th uh, national dual title in a row. Uh, kind of getting a little bit of revenge, not quite, um, but a but beating Life University, Life uh, snapped their NAIA national tournament streak, uh, title streak um, last year. Uh, but this time, uh, uh, Grandview uh, stayed on top in the duels, uh, beating Life in, in the finals. Right. Beat them pretty convincingly, 21 to 10. To 10. And uh, you're right. That doesn't – that doesn't uh change what happened last you know and actually the nationals i think last year i think life kind of snuck up on them i think grandview might have been you know i don't know but you know thinking hey this is ours and life kind of snuck up at least they snuck up on me i didn't quite expect that to happen Mm -hmm. and uh you know so that's a nice nice little bit of revenge i guess and you know you don't wrestle for revenge but it's nice when it happens i guess sure sure um one of the results there, uh, Esco Walker, um, you know, uh, kind of started things off for uh, Grandview, beat the top ranked uh, Brandon Orem for life six to four, and and that kind of set uh, the tone. Uh, uh, is it Josh Pertillo or, or the other? Uh, uh, this is, I think it's Justin. Justin. I, I can't so. remember which one's at uh, Carney and which one's at uh, right. uh, Grandview. Sorry about uh, that, but you're right. Justin uh, uh, Portillo, he had a big win uh, there as well, bumping up. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, beat uh, uh, ninth ranked Jacob Ruiz um, as well. So uh, that was that was big for, for Grandview. Uh, their beat number two life. And what is Portello rank? KJ, do you have that, have that handy? Uh, I do not have that in, I do not have that in front of me. I forgot to look and see it. I, he's got to be in the top one or two or three, I would think at 125. So to bump up and, and beat a, a ninth rank wrestler, that's impressive. I thought that was cool. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he bumped up to 133 and, and beat Hunter Sparks. Boy, I'm having a hard time here. It was Shea Ruffridge, uh, the old Pocahontas area prep that, that knocked off, uh, that beat number nine, Jacob Ruiz. But uh, Portillo still uh, with a big there against Hunter Sparks uh, with a 3-2 decision, um, bumping up from 125 to 133. So wins both of them yep so um and of course iowa didn't have a juco uh program competing i think the uh uh grandview women's wrestlers uh i think they reached the the quarterfinals so grandview had uh A big, uh, a big weekend on the men's and women's side uh, all around, and uh, it was kind of uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, Iowa Wesleyan's girl, the women's team, uh, competed as well. Didn't didn't fare well, but they're getting that program uh, up and running um, as well uh, there in. In Fairfield, did you happen to see? I I saw the clip at, clips afterwards. I can't I can't I don't remember if it was Life or if it was the which team it was that had had the the female first female coach win the national championship. Oh, really? Yeah, and I can't. I, I'm sorry, I didn't re- remember that. Uh, it was pretty. It was very nice. It was very very neat reception. You know, after it was over, when the heavyweight. Uh, through through the their heavyweight through their opponent to the back and got the pin and that sealed the deal and and the the, the angle I saw showed the the throw and the, the bench behind and the coaches and 
and uh, she was very humble. But I think her husband is also the assistant coach, maybe, or because uh, he came over and gave a big hug, and then I heard him talking later. So, yep, uh, Ash Ashley and Christian Flavin. There um, you go. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that that's pretty cool. I didn't realize. Um, uh, it's just one thing. I guess I did, just didn't. Uh, Really, uh, uh, think about or, or uh, give much uh, mind to, but that's definitely a milestone uh, uh, accomplishment there for for Coach Flavin and and the uh, in life. That's pretty cool. I'm not sure what their mascot is called. Life, uh, I don't know. They're, they're they're eagles. What are they? I think they're the running eagles, maybe or eagles out of Georgia. Yep. So that's neat. I thought that was cool. Um, and uh, just really quick here, these uh, this uh, upcoming weekend, uh, Iowa makes its uh, sweep through uh, Illinois. They have Northwestern Friday, Illinois on Sunday. Um, is you and I is you and I on the road or at home this weekend? You and I is on the road, and they wrestle uh, at Northern Col University of Northern Colorado, UNC, and Southwest Minnesota State. Um, and I think they're in Colorado. I'm not sure, but they're um, – anyway, I, I'm not sure what, which one of those schools they, they meet at. But – oh, yeah, sorry, that, sorry, it's UNC – you and I is at, at UNC, and Upper Iowa is at Southwest Minnesota State. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, and then and then uh, Iowa State is the team that has two duels. They're at uh, Mon Montana State uh, Northern, and then Providence. So I Iowa State's hitting some different schools, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, um, you know Thursday they had the duel uh, against Northwest. Uh, what is it? Uh, Kansas Technical <laughs> State College. Something like that, uh, you know, but, uh, oh, hey, one thing, uh, I guess, I wonder if this was on the original ske schedule or not. I'm not sure, but uh, Cal State Bakersfield comes to Ames on Wednesday. Um, oh. What, what, do you, what do you think about uh, the midweek duels that they've had? That's a little bit uh, different for, for most uh, college teams once you get in the the second half of the season. They had one last Thursday, and now they've got Kelsey Bakersfield uh, Wednesday. Right. That was not on the schedule originally, and that I'm aware of anyway. And uh, so, yeah, that's awesome. Kelsey Bakersfield has a great history of, of wrestling. And so, uh, yeah, I'm glad to see them getting revived here and kind of getting it going. So, uh, good. yeah, that'll be, that'll be a good meet. I didn't realize that was going on. So Yeah. Yeah, that caught me by surprise, too, seeing it here on the – Schedule my maybe it was something they added after the right. the uh, cancellation of the Arizona State need or right. so or with the, the division three you've got Co has is that Augustana Illinois on on uh, Thursday and Central's at Loris and then on Friday the Co Wartburg meet has been canceled uh, the the Wartburg camp. Uh, there, there, there will still be within their their window where they can't wrestle. You know, after they've uh, shut down for for COVID, so that one will be postponed. And then uh, Saturday uh, is the uh, Cliff Keen and Mike Duro Invitational out at Cornell. So a lot of schools there. So look forward to to all those. Uh, any other uh, final comments of the college level before we uh, turn our attention to preps? I just say this, any college wrestlers and coaches start living a clean life and keep COVID away. Yeah. So, get, get in your bubble, right? That's uh, in your bubble, yeah. It's for the next uh, two months anyway. Please. <laughs> so we'll uh, turn the, our attention to, uh, High school wrestling here on the Pitting Combination podcast. Uh, 
always enjoy talking uh, with you about that as well. Um, you know, uh, finally a, a big first weekend here of of dual or of tournaments on on Saturday. Uh, of course, uh, kind of jumped right into the heat of the battle here, as we mentioned earlier. That uh, you know we're we're just four and a half uh, weeks until sectionals in the postseason uh, officially begins for some schools. Right. Uh, and we, like you said, jump right into it. I think we should start with Benton community. That's the one that was close. And the, uh, I know Ames was also another big one, a little bit further away that some of the local teams competed in, but Benton community, KJ, I know you were there. So take it away, man. Yeah. I tell you, uh, that's, uh, that's a tournament, um, that, uh, that is probably one of the, one of the best run tournaments. I mean, we were really lucky with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of great programs that run good tournaments, but they're they're right up there among the best um, with the field, the way it's run, everything. Um, and it didn't disappoint. I tell you what, you had three uh, three great teams in West Delaware, Don Bosco and uh, Waukee Northwest. There, they finished one, two, and three. Um, but but West Delaware, I tell you what. Uh, you know, they put five in the finals, only had one champ, Wyatt Volker at 195. Um, but this is the thing that got me, and I think this is, this is what set West Delaware apart from a lot of teams uh, this year and in the past. They had 10 wrestlers that finished fourth or better. Uh, so 10 out of 14 wrestlers uh, made, uh, made the top four, and then they had one more that finished fifth. So you had – all but three wrestlers finished fifth or better. Uh, they were able to win by about 43 points over Don Bosco, who had uh, two champs uh, in Garrett Funk and uh, Jared Theory. But uh, uh, I tell you, they're, they're balanced. And they weren't even at full strength. They're missing one or two guys. Um, they, they just seem to put out a competitive uh, wrestler at each weight. And uh, – you know, you kind of just see that, uh, you know, kind of distance themselves. That's that's what makes them, uh, you know, defending champs and, and ranked number one again this year. Right. And then then uh, Waukee, I see, had the most number of champs. Waukee Northwest, I should say. Right. They had three. Um, Griffin Gamble, uh, he ended up being the uh, – uh, outstanding wrestler voted on by the coaches. Uh, he won a title, their heavyweight, uh, Ben Ryland, um, one, and then, uh, uh, Freeman who had, uh, one of the fastest falls, uh, all one champions, uh, or all one championships for Waukee Northwest. I think it's Carter Freeman, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it the thing, just to kind of reiterate the balance that West Delaware had, uh, you know, they had one champion. You had Don Bosco with two, Waukee Northwest with three. Union Community had two champs, uh, Jace Hedeman, uh, their uh, 106 pounder, and then uh, Hunter Worthen at uh, 152. Um, both of them won. But here, uh, you know, they had one lone champ. Uh, and Wyatt Volker, and uh, they still won by plenty. But um, the, the weights uh, were really, really good. It was kind of interesting, though, a couple medical forfeits in, in the final matches. Uh, you know, both involved uh, the Sanders brothers from Vinton Shellsburg. Cooper Sanders received a medical forfeit from Isaiah Weber of Independence in the 145-pound final, I tell you. Uh, Cooper Sanders, Gabe Sanders was really, really tough. Uh, Gabe Sanders, uh, uh, with the, he uh, medical forfeited to Worthen at 152. But, I, you know, Vin Shellsburg, I think uh, in the tournament rankings, they've climbed to like fifth in 2A, uh, if I saw that correctly. And I kind of see why now, because you've got three guys in the middle of that lineup, and I, and I think they're uh, – impacting the others in that team too but you've got the sanders brothers 
And then uh, Brady Orton at 160 uh, that uh, that could place very, very high on that podium in Des Moines. Man, I can't remember the last time uh, Vinton Shellsburg was, uh, you know, had a maybe a trophy worthy team. I mean, we'll see, um, you know, if they place yeah. high enough. So. The, the closest I remember them having a team that would be maybe top 10 ish. Uh, was when um, Dick Ingvall was coaching. Of course, you know, uh, Coach Ingvall. Um, he was there for a couple of years, and they had five state qualifiers. I think that was in 2007, because I had to leave uh, his, our younger daughter, Kitty, was being born. But I think they had five state qualifiers that year, and uh, they had a potential – I can't remember what they ended up finishing because I ended up leaving uh, the tournament early. And but that's the that's the only time I ever remember Vin shows for being uh, uh, yep. being near that top ten. So that's a, I did game ball, longtime coach at Union and uh, former Jayhawk wrestler. How about that? He was yeah. one of my heroes when I was little. You know, oh, idols really? that I, so. Um, I talked to Dick a couple times this year at different tournaments. Uh, actually, the Benton Youth Tournament, I was up talking with him. He's such a great guy. He's a so, great I, guy, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if he's still doing it. I think so. There's, uh, there's times that I've seen him uh, still contributing to wrestling, working a table or, or something, uh, you know, and, and still kind of making a contribution. So, um Yep. Uh, coaching Vol, one of my one of my favorite uh, one of my favorites to uh, uh, talk to, covering his teams and and just yep. uh, on the side. So exactly, uh, what was he was working the table at the Vinton Shellsburg Youth Tournament earlier this year. So um, okay. also, Kale Bridgewater, how about that? Got a got a win and and uh, Jaden Moore, Kale Bridgewater, North Glen, and Jaden Moore. I don't think you mentioned Jaden uh, Benton Community, so. Not yet. Not yet. Um, uh, with uh, Bridgewater, um, interesting, uh, only five matches coming in. So he hasn't been uh, really uh, in the, the Lynx lineup um, and, and looked pretty good. Winning that 138-pound uh, title beat, Brett Yankovic, uh, in the finals. He's a freshman from West Delaware. That's going to be really good. But Bridgewater – uh nice job i think uh got a reversal um and then uh, a quick tilt for for near fall um that ended up being the, the deciding uh factor so a nice job uh by him uh, hopefully you know he's going to be a mainstay in the lineup here going forward and won't miss much okay you know. side note on kale bridgewater his, his uncle is a hot air balloonist. Uh huh. I've jumped out of his air, out of his uh, uh, balloon. So, really? Wow, guy. that's pretty cool. Good guy, yeah. That's yep. a good guy. And of course, uh, uh, one of the, uh, you mentioned uh, Jaden Moore, uh, you know, being able to win that uh, hometown uh, tournament, you know, being an neck and rod champ as a Benton community uh, wrestler, that's big. Um, you know, he was a, I think he was a state finalist two years ago, maybe, um, uh, was a state place winner, uh, uh, last year. And then now he's undefeated. Uh, I think he's, uh, sitting at number one in the rankings. That's somebody that, uh, uh, really has made some, some gains, has looked, uh, pretty dominant so far and, and somebody that's going to contend for a title um, there as well. And I think Benton had two finalists overall. I think Eli Kuka uh, was a runner-up uh, as well for um, the Bobcats. And then I want to mention, too, uh, Gavin Jensen uh, uh, with a title. I think it's uh, 113 for Williamsburg. And the oh, yeah. reason why I mentioned that um, – Jensen winning the title, uh, Benton Community, Moore winning the title for Benton Community, Bridgewater uh, winning a title for North Lynn, 
Uh, do you know what they have in common? I do not. They're all connected to Jerry Eckenrod and the fact that more wrestles for Benton Community, who, you know. Right. Brad, Brad Bridgewater wrestled for Jerry Eckenrod. And, of course, Grant Eckenrod coaches Williamsburg. So all three of them have connections to uh, Jerry Eckenrod's namesake of the tournament that they won titles at. That's, I thought that was cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, great competition there uh, at Van Horn. Um, and you mentioned uh, Jack, the Jack Mendenhall Invitational, the longstanding uh, uh, tournament there at, at Ames, um, also named after the uh, great coach. Um, Indianola comes away with a team title there, uh, beating Ankeny uh, 161 to 153 and a half. Um, and, of course, we've had uh, – a couple area champs with uh, Blake uh, Jimo, who won at 113 for Prairie, and then Ben Keeter for Iowa City High, won at uh, 220. Right. Uh, and and uh, Jimo is undefeated on the season. He's 27 and 0. So, man, he's he's really got it rolling. And, uh, you know, nice job that, at the Ames Invitational. I've been there many times. And uh, as also the Benton Community Tournament, the Eckenrod, but those teams, those tournaments are not easy. So to win those tournaments, that's nice. Good job. Yeah, I think there's yeah. uh, teams in that Ames Invitational. And we talked to, uh, boy, I, I know we talked about this earlier. You know, uh, Jaimo was a state runner up last year. Uh, that did not sit well with him. You know, he was definitely a kid that wasn't happy, you know, uh, just to be there, you know, wasn't his goal. He he wasn't there just to show up on Saturday night. Um, and, and you can see he put in a lot of time in the off season, and uh, you know it's paying dividends so far this year as he tries to take that one more step. Yeah. Now, uh, and mentioned you know Ben Keeter, uh, he's he's just continued his dominance. I mean, there's not much more to to say there, you know, uh, he just keeps doing Ben Keeter things, really. He has a loss in high school, right? That's what I'm aware of. That's something I missed. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead. Uh, Cedar Rapids Prairie ended, ended up finishing sixth overall, City I 10, Kennedy 12th. Uh, Carter Dolly finished third at heavyweight uh, for the Hawks. Um, Kale Seaton was a uh, runner-up at 120, and Kale Kurtz was third at 126 for City High. And then Kennedy had a finalist in Colin Flanagan and a couple more that uh, got uh, fifth, but Flanagan a runner-up for, for the Cougars at 195. Right. I think Kennedy had five medalists between fifth and seventh place, if I remember right. So – you know, a nice showing for Kennedy there. And uh, like I said, the place in that tournament is doing a good job. So. Right, right. And, and I think the field was huge when, uh, you know, on the on the boys' side. And then I think uh, with the girls, too, it might have been up over 200 wrestlers or so, I think. That's what we reported on our podcast last week. I did not okay. see if that's what it was. If that's what it ended up being, I did see there were seven teams there, so I suspect it was lower lower than what we thought. Um, okay, and, yeah, I think we're gonna they, we expected more than that, so more teams. Uh, one of the uh, area tournaments, uh, the Limar duels, uh, were Saturday. Limar rolled through that. Um, you know, they went five and zero. They beat Western Dubuque in the finals, fifty one twenty three. But uh, Mount Vernon was third, Xavier fourth, Solon fifth, Marion sixth uh, in the eight-team uh, field. Linmar uh, beat Clear Creek Amanda 76-0, 63-15 over Solon, 56-18 over Mount Vernon, and uh, 55-21 over Lamar's. I think that comes down to like a 44.6 uh, 
uh, margin of victory average. Um, but Wimar looks like they're clicking on all cylinders here for the, the final stretch. You know, I, I ref the youth tournament at Linmar on Sunday, and I want to make a couple of comments. First of all, I, 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 when it was over, I, I met, uh, talked to Doug Stryker, Coach Stryker, and and uh, said, he got a pretty decent dual, dual team this year. And he goes, yeah, we're going to do all right, I think. You know, So he was he was uh, kind of downplaying a little bit, but he, he, he knew that he's got a nice one. It was fun to see him do that. So, But the second comment was the wrestlers, that, and both male and female, uh, wrestlers that worked the tables did such a fabulous job. They were, I mean, they were the high school wrestlers and, and uh, the ones that, I, you know, I worked three different mats, so three different tables and I had four workers at each table. So they just did a really great job. I wanted to extend that uh, and, and let them know they did a good job. You know, uh, one of the things that I kind of like, it's, it's just kind of, you know, when I was growing up, Lindmar was considered a basketball school, right? You know, and I mean, I, I know basketball still a big deal and everything, but boy, when Doug Stryker came in, I think the culture changed and the atmosphere around the wrestling program. I think he's he's made Linmar a wrestling school. Right. I, I'll go one step further. I think it was also a football school, too. Oh, okay. that's, that's, that's coach, true. Uh, yeah. Coach Day and uh, uh, anyway, and Coach Thurness, was he also, did he also coach there? A that little that bit? was at Mary. Greg Purnell. Uh, was that Oh, Mary? Okay. At and least so, I, I think Thurness was at Mary. Yeah. Well, he's also a co, but I, I thought he helped yeah. maybe a few schools. And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, but boy, when, when McDonough and uh, uh, Marshall stepped in, it, there's no question. It was all Russell in there, man. Those, with those fabulous wrestlers and, and company. And a lot of others too, but those two really stuck stuck out. Um, one of the things that uh, really caught my attention with Limar's performance, more than just the overall team performance, uh, they're five ranked wrestlers: Braden Park, Kane Nakaborn, Tate Nakaborn, uh, Luke Gaffney, and Grant Kress. They went twenty five and zero on Saturday with twenty four bonus point victories. The one match that wasn't. Uh, bonus point win, uh, Kane Noxaborn, uh, who's ranked third in uh, 3A, bumped up from 132 to 138 uh, to wrestle Jackson Jaspers, who's ranked seventh in 2A from Mount Vernon, and won by decision there. So uh, that that's a heck of a, a weekend for those guys, and no doubt uh, that core group of uh, leaders for the Lions. Right, and that's a nice win because Jaspers is a – Pretty physical wrestler. He's tough. So, yeah, I wouldn't expect more than a than a decision there. I would, you know, anything beyond that would have been huge. I would think. So, uh, another uh, couple more uh, meets. I kind of want to talk about uh, the Chipola Invitational. Um, Lisbon went up there and came away with a team title. Beat Nashville Plainfield 219 and a half to 168 and a half. Lions had seven champs. Uh, Quincy Happel at 126. Kate Seabrecht at 138. Indy Harbaugh at 145. Lincoln Hollow at 152. Max Cole at 82. Indy Ferguson at 220. And then heavyweight White Smith. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's a field with uh, Denver, Nashville. Plainfield is strong, you know. They were they were pretty dominant. Just to compare, Lisbon had 220 points, we'll call it, and Nashville Plainfield had 169. At the Ainsley Invitational, Indianola won it with 161, and the next the second place team was 153. And that West Delaware had a big separation too. So you know you've got teams that's pretty significant. When you have seven champs and and a runner up and two thirds and a fourth, you know you're you don't you're not losing very many matches and and that's that's quite a separation so lisbon doing lisbon things yeah and i, and I think uh similar to west delaware they had 11 guys in the top four there as well um and you mentioned uh you know the one runner up that was probably probably the uh one of the biggest matches of the entire weekend i would say um 
You had number one, Brandon Paez of Lisbon versus number two, Derek Rinkin of Nashville Plainfield. And Rinkin came away with a win, getting a fall in 552. It, uh, he improved to 29-0. and 0. Uh, Paez now 20-1. and 1. But it was one of those things where you kind of wonder, okay, how did this play out? You know, did he – was he behind and caught him at the end or, or something? But going through track wrestling, <clears throat> uh, Rinkin led throughout. He had a takedown in the first, then was up 3-0 after an escape. Paez answered with a takedown, but then an escape and a takedown in the third period, and Rinkin was up 6-2 when he got the fall. And, and, and that, you never know at that point in time, is, is, is uh, Paez, is he trying to, you know, you know, wrestling out outside his his comfort zone, looking for the win or whatever. You know, so Try that could or something. Or... But point taken, he, he, match was well at, at hand. Uh, so uh, yeah, it sounds like he a bit of a dominant. I mean, six two dominant on a very good wrestler. So yeah, definitely haven't seen maybe uh, maybe the Lopez kid from North London, um, but the only one that I've ever seen maybe uh, control. Paez like that, but uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to see this match again, uh, you know, before the season's over. So uh, we'll see how that uh, plays out as well. Uh, just want to mention too, South Winnesheek, uh third at 121 points. They had three uh, finalists uh, in Aiden uh, Fiker, Ethan Maldonado, and Logan Hageman. Um they're at 106, 132, and 195 as well. Um, kind of heading south um, to Highland, the Gary Curtis Invitational is another one of those uh, uh, tournaments that kind of stand out. Um, I'll run that with uh, a team title over Wilton. They beat Wilton by 13 points. Wilton's a, a good team. I think albert has got things climbing back up a little bit. Yeah, we, we mentioned that last week, I think, and then it's fun to see that, that, you know, they uh, they were down a little bit, never really way low, but by Albernet standards, you know, they, they, uh, they're they building it back up and they got their youth going too. I see them, you know, at the youth tournaments. Uh, they had two champions in Brody Neighbor at 132 and Carson Klosterman at 145, had five finalists overall and seven in the top three. So uh, not only are they showing that talent, but they're starting to get a little depth and balance to their lineup as well. Right. The last couple of years, they've, they've had a forfeits, as I recall, you know, quite a few in their varsity lineup, just didn't have bodies at those ways. So I think they're really filling that in. So. So good to see you. It'll be interesting to follow them uh, as they go along here. Just want to mention one of, one of the individuals that really caught my attention the second weekend of the, the season um, Aaron Boone, uh, I'm going to start calling him Aaron freaking Boone, uh, you know, because of the, the former Major League Baseball player that they would, uh, as a Yankee fan, he had the home run against uh, Boston, and Boston would call him Aaron freaking Boone. But uh, Aaron Boone of Washington uh, uh, won the 113-pound title, uh, was named OW of the tournament. Um, he beat number two ranked Brody Brisker, of Wilton 5-4 in the finals, handed Brisker his first loss of the season uh, while improving to 31-0 and zero himself. And it, he's somebody that has really impressed you early on, just a freshman for the Demons. Right. I, that was stuck out for me as well. A battle of the unbeatens in one and two and, you know, just in a 5-4 to four match. So that one would have been a fun one. And like you said, I bet we're not done seeing that one this year. Nope. Um, uh, Washington ended up with two champs overall. Chase Greiner uh, won at 160 pounds. South Timo was there as well, and they got third. Logan Arp was the champ at 138. And then uh, I mentioned uh, Iowa City Regina's Aiden Udell won the 170 uh, pound title uh, for the Regals there. So uh, good tournament, uh, good performances there. Uh, as well this weekend uh you know we get right back into it uh you know i know uh there are a couple big uh, matchups here in the metro uh xavier and kennedy on thursday night 
Glenmar at Prairie. Uh, also Thursday night, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see the Battle of 42nd Street. Um, and then, you know, Lindmar and Prairie always come down to it. Um, but as far as Thursday and Saturday, what are some of the uh, duels tournaments that uh, you're kind of looking forward to? Well, Saturday's the Jayhawk. Did you mention that? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Thursday, I just, this just dawned on me when you said that. Does, did the Xavier and Kennedy have a, 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 something that they pass back and forth? Because I just came up with an idea. I don't think they do. What is it? They need to get like a 42nd Street street sign. Oh, that would be cool. That'd be cool. Like with the pole and, you know, just so you, you know, whoever wins it gets the, the, the street sign and then uh, keeps that for the year. And then, if, you know, if they have to pass it over or whatever, I think that'd be pretty cool. That would be, that would be kind of neat. Oh, we'll have to let uh, the coaches know. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, would, that would be, uh, I think that would be cool. You could, uh, Kind of like, uh, you know, uh, the Del Buck Trophy where half of it's one team color, the other, you could do the same thing with the street sign. Oh, yeah. Half, yeah. half green, half navy or something like that. One side, one side, one color, one side, the other. One, <laughs> yeah, there you go. We're, we are on to something and we should make it and sell it to these two schools. <laughs> that, would, who, who, that would be sweet. I'm. Yeah. Who do we know in the street department? Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh. This this weekend, um, I'm gonna be at the uh, the Jayhawk. Um. There uh, mentioned uh, the Lloyd uh, Schaefer tournament. Um. So long said Haydenfeld tournament. Trying to trying to get a list of teams here at, uh, at each of those. Have you seen the list of teams that are going to be there, at Jeff? I've not seen it, but generally it's like uh, Hampstead, Jefferson, Fort, Fort Madison, generally one or two Davenport schools, Clinton, Muscatine maybe, um, some, uh, some from out west, maybe Fort Dodge has been there in the past, Underwood. So, I mean, I don't know exactly, but those are teams that have been there in the past. Kind of hoping Underwood will, will make the trip back since, uh, you know, they're they have a team that performed very well. Was at the Council Bluffs uh, uh, Classic in the first half of the season? Um, would like to see them compete here again. Of course, uh, you know, when they came, we had that great battle between uh, Pesky and Thompson, too. Um, <laughs> you know, at the, at Jefferson. And then, and then also, uh, Millage at the time, uh, and uh, Thompson, I think it was, wasn't yeah. it? Yep. Now, now, um, Russell's in Minnesota. Uh, Millage, Blockus. Blockus, thank you. Sorry, Blockus now. So, great, great ballast. Yeesh. Yeah, looking, uh, finally got him pulled up here at the, uh, um, finally got pulled up here on the uh, on track wrestling, and the teams listed on track. Uh, a couple of them surprised me actually, uh, but might be in the rotation now. Uh, you got Albernet, Boone, Cedar Falls, Clinton, uh, Devonport Central and North, Dubuque, Hempstead, Forest City, Fort Madison, um, Iowa City High will be there, West Des right. Moines Valley. Is listed. Okay. Uh, Waterloo East, Waukee Northwest is listed as well. Hmm. Um, and uh, Muscatine. So, so uh, if that's uh, if that ends up being the field, I mean, if if everybody uh, shows up that's listed, that'll that'll be fantastic. that'll be a great tournament to. Many of those teams have been there for years and years that you mentioned. The, the, the newer ones that haven't been are like Waukee Northwest. Um, let's see. Uh, that uh, Who else is that? A couple others in there that, that uh, are going to make it. A, a, oh, I City High is back. They were in it early on and, and, and then got out and were out for many years, and now they're back again. So Yeah, been a couple of years uh, since they've been there. 
Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, that's great. And I love, you know, it being from 1A to 3A, um, that always adds another dimension to this. Uh, uh, kind of built, well, go ahead. I kind of built that tournament. I didn't want it to be like Mississippi Valley uh, teams necessarily. Uh, you know, I wanted to get a, a good uh, selection from all over the state, which it still is. So I'm glad to see that and, and hear that. So. Yeah, uh, looking at the teams listed at the uh, uh, the Lloyd Schaefer Invitational at Marion, you've got Atlantic uh, Cam coming all the way over from the west side of the state. Uh, Benton Community, uh, Cedar Rapids Kennedy is listed. Um, not sure if that's varsity or JV that's going to join, but um, if it's a varsity, I think that's new for, for Kennedy. Uh, you got Grinnell, Keokuk, uh, Louisa Muscatine, Maquoketa, Marion, Monticello, Mount Vernon, North Butler, Clarksville, uh, which uh, the first thing that comes to mind there is uh, Chet Buss uh, coming down. Uh, he's a, a UNI signee uh, that people, uh, if you haven't seen him wrestle at heavyweight, you take the chance to, to do that. Um, North Lynn, uh, Overland Park uh, from Kansas, uh, Blue oh. Valley Northwest uh, High School. Then you got Williamsburg, Wilton, and Xavier rounding out the field there um, at Marion. So these are fantastic tournaments. Uh, that's not even getting into the Hayden Felt here that um, I'll mention quick at Solon. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, Lisbon has been a part of that field. Right. And the teams listed at track are Center Point Urbana, Clear Creek Amana, or Center Point Urbana, Clear Creek Amana. Say that two times fast. <laughs> uh, Dyke New Hartford, Green County, Iowa City Liberty, Iowa Valley, uh, Lisbon, North Cedar, North Scott, Pella, uh, Vinton Shellsburg. We mentioned the Sanders brothers and Brady Ortner there uh, for the Vikings, uh, West Branch, and, and West Liberty. Um, who has some good individuals, uh, Colin Cassidy at 106, Drake Collins at 170, who was a champ at uh, Benton this last uh, last weekend. So, man, some great competition here uh, to really to really get us into this uh, second full weekend of uh, competition after the break. Right. It seems like there's some high-powered tournaments every week, doesn't it? That's awesome. Yeah. Especially after after the uh, after the break, uh, you hit these, and the next thing you know, you're in conference and postseason mode. So it's it's coming quick. Yep, yep, for sure. All right. Uh, any any final thoughts, Briggsy, uh, before we call the call the podcast? No, uh, apologize for the technical glitch early on and had to think on our feet here and go a different direction, but uh, technically with the zoom, but uh, good to go. And I uh, can't wait to see the results this week. Yep. And uh, right. You got to make adjustments, right? No matter what you're doing in a match in life, you make adjustments right. and go forward. Right. Right. All right. Well, Hey, thanks for watching everybody. We appreciate you tuning in and, uh, giving us a platform to talk wrestling uh, together and with you. Uh, with that being said, thanks for watching. And Bricky, why don't you take us out? Let's keep wrestling on the move.